Okay, so the um, the regression uh, competition on Kaggle does, um, uh, and and this is the setup that and the the private is is there's no overlap between the private and the public. Here. Okay, um, so on the in the regression competition, it com it's football data. Okay, and so it's American football, and. And I don't know if you ever watch American football or not. Um, LA now has two teams, <laughs> and um, and well, but anyway, um, there's uh, you know the goal is to score touchdowns, okay? Score uh, to get your uh, to get the football into the end zone, and generally you want to kind of carry it in there. Um, or, or have a person holding it when you get in there, and that's a touchdown, and that's worth six points. Um, but if you can't get a person to carry it or hold it when you're in the uh, end zone, you can also kick it in, okay? And that's worth half as much, and you get three points uh, for that. And those, those are your primary ways of scoring. There's a few other things. You get, like, extra points for here and there but um, and safeties and stuff. But but that's pr primarily it. You want to get your uh, the ball down into the uh, the end zone, um, and so one team is trying to move it forward and the other team is trying to inhibit that forward progress, okay? And then uh, moving forward is done primarily in two ways. One is uh, called rushing, which is a person carries the ball and runs, and that's called rushing the ball. And then the other is um, passing, the, uh, you know, the quarterback, will, which is a player, one of the players will throw the ball forward and then someone will try to catch it. And those are those are your primary ways of getting um, the ball forward. The other team is doing whatever it can to prevent the um, the team with the ball from getting their ball forward. Okay. And if they successfully slow down the progress, which is defined as if they prevent the other team from gaining ten yards within four attempts, um, then uh, then they get the ball. Okay. And so, um, so they, they switch sides and, and things like that. And so, um, so anyway, you have a bunch of in the um, in the football data. Not the. Let me go to football train. Okay. Corrupt or unsafe? What? Do you guys get this message when you download it? That's weird. I just created this. Okay, so maybe I'll uh, all right. So maybe uh, I'll define all these things. Okay, so yards is so um, you know how many. Uh, this is for the entire season. Um, and in the entire uh, football season, they play a total of 16 games, okay? And so uh, that's the regular season. And, um, and so the number of wins will go anywhere from 0 to 16. And, and generally, you want to be above 8, okay? Um, so if you have 9 wins, then you've had a winning season. And if you have less than 8, you're, you've had a losing season. Um, and and, and coaches who have uh, like if they're for the last five years they don't go above eight they'll get fired type of thing you know so so there's a lot of pressure to generate wins okay and so um, I've purposely removed certain um, certain variables like how many points they scored over the season because that's like too 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 strongly correlated with wins and it's almost like it defeats <laughs> the, the prediction purpose, okay? So I've, I've removed some of those things. Um, but you have things like yards. See, so yards is how many, um, how much uh, kind of forward progress they made, okay? And you can have a team that gets a lot of forward progress, and that's usually a good team, but there are teams that can make lots of forward progress, but for whatever reason, they can't get the ball into the end zone, right? They have trouble in what they call the red zone, where it's like this is really where it, the, the forward progress matters and they have trouble in that area. And, and so, you know, but yards will probably be one of the most important variables there, okay? 
offensive plays is how many times they got to start with the ball. Um, and so you can do things like yards per offensive play. You can try creating new variables where you're taking ratios between some of these things, right? Um, turnovers lost means basically um, the, the ball went to the other team and um, fumbles lost is, is when there's... A, <clears throat> so the player who holds the ball, like their, their job is to move forward and if they can't move forward, that's not great, but it's okay. It happens quite a bit, okay? But the worst is if they're holding the ball and then they drop the ball. And if they drop the ball, then the other team can steal the ball and then they get the ball. And that's, that's like, that's even worse than um, just not being able to run forward. And, and that's called a fumble and that, that's a really bad thing. Um, it doesn't happen very often, generally around one fumble, two fumbles a game, uh, one per each team. More than that, it's like a bad, it's like bad, okay? So one, one fumble a, t a game, these numbers should be pretty low, I think. Like, so let's see. Yeah, fumbles lost. So for uh, this team had four wins, so they were a bad team and they had 11 fumbles lost. This team had 12 wins, which is good, and they had a they had 14 fumbles lost. So this is around it should be less than one fumble per game type of thing. Okay, um, and and you can um, look up um, a, a little bit more. First downs is like how many times they've successfully moved forward. Um, you you have to you get you're considered getting making good forward progress. Um, if you get uh, 10 yards in four attempts, and that's that's considered a first down. I guess I can. What what I can do is I can give you kind of a definition uh, of each of these things, uh, and that that will probably help. Okay, but um, but yes, I I would recommend or not maybe not recommend, but just one thing that you could consider is taking some ratios between some of these things, right? So one is you know passes attempt and passes completed. Um, so you can see, you know, make a ratio of like percentage of completions or something like that. So a pass complete is they threw the ball and the person caught, and that's a completion. And then an attempt is just anytime they throw the ball. So a lot of times the, the quarterback, the player will throw the ball and the person on the receiving end is just is not able to catch it or the, the ball lands somewhere else. Okay, and so those count as passes attempted but not completed. Okay, and so you can do things like percentage of completions, and and so those are those are just some some things to consider. Okay, you don't you don't have to do um, all of them, and and they might help um, and things like that, right? And then again, there's two kinds of two primary ways of getting the ball to move forward. One is carrying, called rushing, and then the other is passing. And you can also look at you know what percentage of plays are rush attempts versus pass attempts, okay? You know, percentage rushing type of things and, and stuff. And, um, and, you know, those ratios could be, could be useful, so. Okay, um, that's that. I'll, I'll give you a full, sorry, I'll, I'll give you a full definition of each of these, um, each of these things, you know. Yes? Um, Yes, yes, the op is the same thing, but for the opposing team. So, um, uh, so in football, not everybody, uh, the, the teams are divided into divisions, and the teams will play the teams in the, in the same division more frequently than the teams in, like, there's there's 32 teams okay total in the in the NFL and and if there's only 16 games in the season you're not going to have a chance to play everybody right so but you always the the teams always do play um, everyone in their own division and so um, so everybody so people get slightly different things and so there's kind of some question like oh maybe this team had to face uh, like 
all of their opponents were like really strong opponents. And then this team got away by having, uh, you know, relatively weak opponents and stuff like that. And so, um, so we keep track of kind of the um, opponents' um, stats, and and you know, is it, um, you know, is it more? Um, and the opponent stats is really kind of a, a measure of how strong the uh, the defense is. Okay, so a football team, you'll have um, basically two divisions of the team, and that don't like never interact with each other. You have the offensive side, and they do whatever they can to move the ball forward, and then you have the defensive side, which tries to prevent the other team from moving their ball forward. And so um, the um, so mo um, most of the things that don't have op for opponent is all measures of how good the offense is, and then the um, all the measures that say opponent is really a measure of how good the defense is. So, um, and and there's uh, people arguing that saying you know defense is more important than offense or you know who knows right? They're both very important, uh, and I don't know right. It's it's not like basketball where in basketball the same five players play offense and then as soon as the ball switches the same five players are now playing defense and things like that okay in football you have t players who only play offense and then when the the ball switches then those the all of those offensive players no longer play and then the entire other set of players the defensive team um, goes on the field uh, so um, Okay, but yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll provide a kind of a data dictionary, uh, providing a little bit more definitions for each of these things, uh, if you're not super familiar with um, American football. Okay, um, I wanted to just wrap up a little bit on um, the decision trees, a little bit of boosting. I, I don't know if you guys read through this section. Um, I updated the notes on boosting and uh, just kind of gave a little bit more um, concrete examples uh, using numbers, okay? And, and so again, here I'm doing um, boosting with the toy example, and of course we would never actually do boosting for such a simple example, but it allows us to see where the numbers are coming from, okay? And so, um, so when we do boosting, uh, here's my x and here's my y, uh, one, two, three, four, five, for x and one one three seven eight for y, and so um, uh, again, that I think I showed this. This is just kind of the uh, the data, and if you have no uh, input, then then the mean is just going to be uh, four for everybody. Okay, and so that's going to kind of be your starting prediction, and that's that's kind of where we start with boosting here. Okay, so we start with um, predicting four for everybody, and then we measure the residuals. Okay, so uh, so the one if we're doing four has a residual of minus three, minus three, minus one, three, uh, and four. Okay, and so um, with boosting, what we do is we effectively fit a tree between x and the residuals. Okay, and um, and so if we fit a decision tree. It's going to say um, that, so basically, it's going to basically fit um, this tree here, okay? And it says, well, if it used to be four, you know, our new prediction when we do the decision tree should go up to seven and a half and down to five thirds. And so from four, the, um, the adjustment to here is uh, plus three and a half, and the adjustment from here to here is minus two and one third or something like that okay is that okay for um, what what that's doing okay so it says so when we do the tree um, here we see the adjustment is plus three and a half from four to get us to seven and a half and then the adjustment for everything less than that is minus two and a third okay and, and it gives us the resulting um, 
scores. And so this is, so it basically fits a tree there, except with boosting, you don't say, all right, just add three and a half and subtract 2.33. With boosting, you multiply it by this uh, kind of lambda learning rate, which slows down the kind of adjustment that you can, okay? And usually this lambda is something very small, like 1%, 0.01, okay? But to kind of make the point of how this works, I, I purposely picked a really big lambda of like 0.3, okay? And so, um, so our predictions will be 4 minus 2.33, but we, we adjust or we slow down the learning by multiplying it by 0.3, okay? And so if you do 0.3 times 2.33, this becomes um, negative 0.7, and so 4 minus 0.7 becomes 3.3. .3. And then if you do it for the 3.5, 0 0.3 times 3.5 is 1.05, and 4 plus that becomes 5.05, okay? So, so my pre predicted values um, are, uh, are 3.3, 3.3, 3.3, and 5.05, and 5.05, okay? And so these are our um, predicted values, and these are the now the residuals that we have, okay? Is that okay with how I'm getting these things? And then, and so what I do now with boosting is you fit a tree to the residuals, and then you um, and you say, well, this, these are what the adjustments we should make should be, but you don't make those adjustments. You like slow down and you just say, all right, instead of doing adding three and a half to go from four to seven and a half, we're going to multiply that by you know a small factor. Generally, it's around one percent or something like that. Okay, so instead of adding three and a half, we would add 0.35 and my adjustment would go from 4 to 4.35, okay? But we're accelerating it just, just for the point of this, this thing, okay? And then we do the same thing, and so now I'm going to fit x to these residuals of negative 2.3, negative 2.3, negative 0.3, 1.95, and 2.95, and we say, okay, go ahead and fit a decision tree between x and r here, okay, x and the residuals, mm -hmm. all right? And here it says, okay, we should make the split at three and a half again, and the adjustment we would make for these is negative 1.63, and the adjustment we make over here is plus 2.45, okay? And, uh, and again, we don't go full, uh, the full amount. We multiply that by, you know, the, our learning rate of 0.3, okay? And so instead of going down negative 1.63, we go down 0.3 times this, and our new values are 2.81, 2.81, 2.81, and 5.785, 5.785, okay? And, uh, and we get the residuals, and now I get residuals of negative 1.81, negative 1.81, 0.19, 1.215, and 2.215, okay? And so we do this one more time, and at this point, we'll see this is kind of where boosting starts to differentiate itself from the tree, is that by, because we're forcing it to fit on the residuals, here, when I fit the decision tree to this data, the split is no longer at the same spot. Every time before, it was always at between 3 and 4, and we were splitting at 3.5. But now, we are doing the split between 2 and 3 at 2.5, and okay, at 2.5. And, and we can see that it says, well, if you, want, if you do the split at 2.5, you should fit negative 1.81, and over here, you should go uh, 1.2067, okay? And again, we wish we could do that, but we slow down our learning, and we push it down here, and we push these up by this amount, by 0.3, okay? And so it's, um, we fit the residuals each time, we're fitting a decision tree to the residuals, and we say these are the adjustments that we should make, but we don't do the full adjustment, we only do like a, a small amount, right? So it's kind of like, um, um, I don't know how you guys, if, if you guys drive cars and if you play with your, uh, the, the temperature, right? And I don't, there, there, I've, I feel, my wife and I always get in an argument over this, right? So I don't like to change the temperature on my car drastically. Like if it's 
If it's uh, hot, I like to just kind of do it a little bit cool, and if I'm feeling cool, I do a little bit warm, right? My uh, and I and I don't like to change the air setting to like plus four. I just do like you know just a little bit of air, okay? Um, but like for my wife, when it's hot, she'll like immediately crank it to um, max air and turn the temperature all the way to max cold, and then she'll like let that run for a long time. And then she'll be like, oh, it got too cold. And then she'll crank it up to like heat. And I'm like, what are you doing? But, but anyway, OK. So, so <laughs> the boosting is just the opposite of that, OK? It's saying don't make these drastic things. Don't like crank it to max cold. Don't crank it to max hot. Just make tiny minor adjustments. Do a small adjustment. See what, it, what has happened. And if you still need to keep adjusting it to cold, keep running that, and then just keep making minor, minor changes, OK? And, uh, and that's, that's what boosting is, OK? Um, whereas you know the regular decision tree just says, oh, this is the best fit value, and this is the best fit value. Let's just pick those and go with that, OK? And, and that's totally fine. Decision trees work well. Um, boosting um, works well uh, in a different way. And, and I think boosting, you can kind of get finer tuned things, but it requires it to run a little bit longer because it is you're you're doing the slow things. Okay, but anyway, so this is the result. These are our predictions we get when I've done boosting. And again, this is just a toy example. Generally, your learning rate is much smaller, something like 0.01, and you have to run like hundreds of these trees, and it's a computer automated process. Okay, R does uh, boosting. Okay, and I can here I give it the intentionally bad settings that I used. So shrinkage of 0.3, which is you know way too big. Number of trees is three, which is way too small. So generally, it's number of trees is like 1,000, and shrinkage is like 0.01, OK? So those are the general settings. But here, here I'm using the bad settings, just so I can show you that when I fit this model, I do indeed get the same values, 2.267, 3.172. I'm getting those same values when um, when I did it manually, okay. So 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 this is what um, basically R did when it ran three trees with a shrinkage of 0.3. Uh, but you know, probably in uh, real life, it would be like thousands of trees and a shrinkage of 0.01, and and you'll get um, good fits, okay. Um, and so this is this is the result of our our uh, boosted fits which is currently doing a very bad job. We need to let it run longer and, um, and whatever, but you know, generally do better, OK? Um, and so, that, so that's boosting um, just from a kind of a high le higher level perspective. I, well, I guess here we got into the little nitty gritty of the calculations. Um, but, um, but I just wanted to cover that. Okay, I don't know. Are there any questions on boosting? Yeah. So if you want to slow down this process, I'm going to go up the screen. Uh, which is a little bit point. Please slow down this process. Um. So by uh, by fitting only the residuals and making small adjustments you are uh, kind of less likely to um, uh, overfit the, uh, um, the data. It's, it's hard to see with our toy example, OK? In our toy example, I only had a few observations. But in a bigger data set, um, Uh, I guess in a bigger data set, you'll have like multiple observations for the same predictor, right? Like x equals 3, you'll have like y equals 2, and y equals 4, and y equals 6, or something like that, right? And you're trying to figure out like which is the best value to kind of pick in, in, in between there for that thing. And, and so, um, so boosting um, generally. Uh, is, is a little bit more robust against uh, overfitting uh, be, because it's what we call a slow learner. Uh, and so uh, 
it it has it's like refining its method by just making tiny adjustments uh, along the way. So uh, try. I, I don't know if there's another example. I don't know if this air conditioner example made any sense, but. Um, <laughs> Um, but um, but that's what we have there. Okay. Um, okay. Um, today I'll talk about chapter nine, and uh, and the chapter is support vector machines. I haven't prepared um, notes or slide for today, but I think I think we'll be okay. <laughs> Um, so support vector machines. We've uh, we've really gotten through a bunch of stuff here. Um, probably I I can I I don't know if there's much to say, like other than it's a version of boosting. Okay, but I I guess we can run a few examples. Um, and just say this is how the computer runs it, um, and and to be honest, I don't know if I know if I fully understand the inner workings of XGBoost, but I do know it's like very popular and very powerful, and everyone likes to use it these days. So um, yeah, I think I think the winning methods for most Kaggle competitions employ either XGBoost or neural networks. Those seem to be the Kind of the most frequently used. Sure, you can. I'm not going to stop you. You didn't learn it. You haven't learned it here, right? Um, it's true. Um, you're allowed to, right? If you want to, if you want to go out and read like how to use it and stuff, um, that's fine, right? So this is. Kind of uh, broad strokes for uh, a lot of these different learning uh, methods, and and I guess you know we'll wrap up chapter ten next week, and then I've got Wednesday and Monday, Wednesday of week five and Monday of week six, and I can talk about some of these other things that aren't in the book, but I won't put them on the test and stuff, and and again for the test. It'll basically just be the um, <coughs> conceptual questions at the end of each chapter. So, so those are all game. And, uh, uh, okay. Anyway, we'll talk um, support support vector machines. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, support vector machines. These sound so cool, um, but really, at the it sounds like such a cool idea, right? Support vector machines. Like, what is that? Um, really, you're just drawing a line to separate points. Um, it's it's not it's not that exciting. It, it it you can do cool stuff with it in in high dimensionality. But um, but we're gonna um, we're basically just drawing a line to separate uh, one class of points from another, um, and these things we're gonna look at the maximal margin classifier and the support vector classifier and the support vector machine. Now technically, the maximal margin classifier and the support vector classifier are also support vector machines, but I guess these are like simpler versions and. To kind of s distinguish them, we'll we'll use the terminology that the book uses. Okay, so um, yeah, the maximal margin classifier um, is the first thing. Okay, um, and so first, these lights are too bright for me. Um, There we, okay, there we go. Oh, wait, okay. Um, 
Okay. So first we just basically talk about what a hyperplane is. And a hyperplane is basically a straight line or a flat surface. Um, so if it's in two dimensions, you draw a straight line. If it's in three dimensions, it's a flat surface. And if we can imagine higher dimensions, then it's a, a flat hyperplane, okay? I don't know what a flat hyperplane looks like in four dimensions, but it's the next step up if you can visualize, visualize that, okay? So a hyperplane is just, it's basically the generalization of a straight line in higher dimensions. Okay, so if you've got, um, so if you've got uh, two dimensions, maybe I should draw. Okay, so this this counts as a hyperplane. All right, and then if we're uh, talking um, three dimensions, then then you've got something. This this sheet is is a hyperplane. Okay. Now, um, so this technically counts as a. I guess a, this is a linear boundary. And this is a, a plane, and in higher dimensions, you have a hyperplane. Right. Okay, and so when you talk about how do we define this thing, this uh, has the equation y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 x, okay? And then this one will be y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2, okay? And then in higher dimensions, it's going to be beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 plus dot 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 up to beta p x p. I think those are the letters they use. Yeah, in the p-dimensional setting, okay, this is what we get, all right? And so whatever, whatever this thing it is that we're kind of trying to visualize, um, we get something like this, right? Okay, oh, and I guess, I guess, yeah, they set this equal to zero. Okay, zero equals beta zero plus beta one xp. Okay, um, so yeah, we can go ahead and define this. All right, as zero. Okay, and then um, and on one side below it, you have um, the values where it's less than the hyperplane and values where it's above the hyperplane, right? So, um, so if you are um, on the hyperplane, um, this is where it's equal to zero. And then you can also say, well, you can either be above greater than zero or below the hyperplane, um, below zero, okay? So we can kind of define where, uh, which points are above and below. Okay, and so that's given if we have already decided what, where the plane is located, if we know what our beta values are, right? And, uh, and so what the marginal maximum classifier and um, says is, well, um, given a set of points where we know the class and we know that these are, you know, one class and these are another class, where should I draw the line, right? What, what values of beta 0 and beta 1 and beta whatever should I pick 
so that I get a nice boundary, right? Okay, so uh, so this is just a picture of a two-dimensional um, hyperplane. Uh, so here we have x1 and x2. So, um, so there's technically no y here, and we're just we're just drawing this boundary. This is where it's at zero, and we get um, get these things. Okay. Um, so we're gonna kind of do this, and so here we have um, some points, and they've they've been labeled as blue or what color is that? Pink, purple. Okay, blue and purple. All right. So we've got um, two classes of points, and technically, any of these three lines here count as a uh, as a plane that separates that perfectly separates the blue class from the purple class. Okay, and um, and if we were to cho choose this one, okay, this is kind of what how the classification would work. If this were our boundary, we would say anything to the right of this line is going to be um, purple and anything to the left of the line is blue okay um, but technically all three of these work as uh, as a boundary hyperplane that will classify things either as blue or purple and for our training data it doesn't get anything wrong okay but um, I would argue that this is not necessarily the best well who knows what the best is okay well this is but this is not the maximum maximal margin classifier okay and so the maximal margin classifier says you know what when we draw this line okay I'm gonna just go ahead and copy this we get something called a margin which is basically how much like wiggle room do we have between the uh, boundary and um, the nearest observation. Okay. I guess I'll save this. There's not much to save here. Okay. And so if we uh, if we do this. You know, we get uh, there's a margin here that basically is, you know, if we run parallel, uh, a, a draw a line parallel to this thing. I don't. Is that is that about right? Okay, so I'm kind of drawing this right, and um, and this represents. So this is our boundary. And technically, the uh, the width here um, the width of this from here to here this is technically our margin okay um, and it's kind of the the width between this boundary and here this this width and this width technically are all the same right whoops okay so um, so we have the margin, and uh, and it's the distance between the the line and kind of the the nearest uh, points here, right? And so um, so the maximum margin classifier says pick the boundary so that this margin, as we define it, um, will be as wide as possible. Okay. So maximum margin says let's pick the boundary. Where the margin, okay, and so the margin is going to be um, the distance from boundary to uh, kind of the, I guess this is the perpendicular distance, perpendicular distance from the boundary to the nearest kind of point. To the boundary, all right, and this is this is again this is assuming all the points are correctly classified. Okay, and so um, so the the book covers kind of the mathematical um, ideas, 
here and and I'm I think it's okay if I just give you the geometric okay the geometric uh, idea all right and so here this is going to be the resulting maximum marginal classifier so here this is the exact same data that uh, this picture that I have over here Okay, so this picture and this picture oops, show the uh, the same data. You can see that, um, but by show, drawing the line this way, okay, we can uh, get produce a larger margin. Okay, so I mean it doesn't look like that much. Uh, I don't know if it looks that drastic to you, but um, but this this margin here. Uh, so 260, is this about the same? Comparable. Okay. And so um, so we can see that you know the margin here is a lot smaller and then the margin here is wider. Okay. And so this is going to be the um, the maximum margin classifier. So this is the largest possible margin that we can do. Um, and you can arrive at this using some, um, I guess, uh, mathematical optimization method, okay? Um, we don't have to worry about that, or I'm not gonna make you guys worry about that in our class, okay? We're just gonna say uh, the computer does a good job of finding this thing for us. But this is going to be the resulting maximum margin classifier. Okay, so this is the margin again. This this distance here is the margin, and this is the the widest po the largest possible margin for this data set. Largest possible margin. For this data, okay, where all points are correctly classified. Okay, so there's, um, so you're not going to find another line in here where you can still classify all the points correctly, where you're going to end, you get a larger margin. Okay, any, anything else, um, it's going to be a little bit skinnier. Okay. okay, and so that's the maximum margin classifier, right? And that's basically the primary idea of a support vector machine, okay? Um, so if you understand the idea of like, okay, we're going to draw this line to maximize, um, you know, kind of this margin here, then, then it's, then you're good, okay? Now, the thing is, is that really this boundary is really just determined by these three points, okay? And I could add more points. Uh, over here, like more purple points anywhere over here, and the boundary does not change, okay? Uh, I could add more blue points over here, and wherever I add them, or I could take away blue points, okay? And this boundary is not going to change. Does that kind of make sense? Okay, and so there's really only, only these three points are influencing where this boundary exists, and so, so those three points are called the support vectors because those are the the points that de determine where the boundary are and, and so this is an interesting thing about support vector machines is that for points that get correctly classified and are not support vectors their locations don't really matter we don't like this a point out here is not more blue than a, than this point over here okay or you know these points over here they're not like more blue class than 
than this. Okay, they're all the same. Um, they all get just classified as blue. Okay, but if I put a new point somewhere in here, that's going to change the um, decision boundary. Or if I put a point here, or if I take away this point, that's going to change where the decision boundary is drawn. Okay, and so uh, where the decision boundary is only affected by uh, uh, a subset of the points. Okay, and so this is the maximum margin um, classifier here. All right, um, so that that's great and all, and. Uh, and I could like give you toy data sets and stuff where you, um, I say, draw the maximum margin classifier, and we'd probably get um, some pretty good things, okay? This is kind of the mathematical ideas of the um, maximum margin classifier. So here we want to maximize M. M is the margin, okay? M is the margin uh, that we have, okay, um, using the different kind of Maximize M by adjusting the different parameters of the plane, okay? And this constraint here is not really a constraint. It kind of is. It's just, it's just so that you get a unique solution, okay? So you can kind of think of this as, uh, you know, we're defining um, our boundary. And technically, any um, multiple, like if I multiplied all of my uh, values and stuff, then um, then then it could work. But um, subject to this constraint, this this is just to kind of make sure you get a unique value, and this is really uh, the part that uh, requires um, things be correctly classified. Okay, so when you multiply the x times the boundary, okay, this will either end up being positive or negative, depending on which side. Uh, of the boundary that point is on, and then this is the, the classification. And so this just says this has to be greater than, uh, than a certain value, um, uh, the greater than the margin, okay? Meaning um, every point that we have has to be um, correctly classified. So if it's on the negative side, okay, then yi will be negative, and the product of x times beta will also be negative and negative times negative will be positive. And then if uh, x is positive, what, um, if, if we're on the other side of the boundary and y is positive, positive times positive will also be positive, okay? Again, don't worry so much. I'm not gonna test you on this math stuff, okay? But this is, this is the picture that we have for the maximum margin classifier. We, um, we can, I guess, transition into what's known as the support vector classifier, okay? When we have data where it's no longer possible, it's no longer possible to draw a single straight line that separates our data perfectly. Okay, so with data like this, where do we draw? Okay, I don't know if, if you guys can see the colors well enough. Okay, but the purple and the blue are mixed, and it's not going to be possible to draw one straight line that perfectly classifies the data, okay? And so now, um, for the support vector classifier, we have to relax kind of uh, the rules, okay? So before it used to, the rule was draw a straight line and make sure all the blues end up on one side and all the purples end up on the other side, okay? And now we're gonna say, okay, draw a straight line and now all the blues will not end up on one side and all the, you know, um, it's okay if some purples end up on the wrong side and some blues end up on the wrong side, but we don't want very many of those types of things, okay? And, um, and the thing about the support vector classifier is that it does not, um, it doesn't say try to minimize how uh, how many mistakes or how how the mistakes are. It's not a it's not a minimization thing. Here we're still trying to maximize kind of um, I guess um, 
the, the margin is now a little bit more poorly defined. Um, but we're still trying to find a boundary and we're kind of given a budget for mistakes, okay? We say if it ends up on the wrong side, if it ends up on the wrong side of the boundary, okay, that's okay, but that's gonna cost you, okay? It's gonna cost you um, some money, right? And then we, and, uh, and each of these mistakes costs this much money. Um, and so, um, so it's gonna draw a boundary and, and we say you have this much money, this much of a budget, for kind of misclassifications, and uh, and it draws a, a line um, based on that. Okay, and so um, so we no longer um, um, get um, have this uh, thing. Okay, so here let me. Um, so this is one issue. This this picture tells us that okay, this is one reason why we might prefer the support vector classifier, even in situations where we can um, draw uh, good boundaries. Okay, so here this was the data, and this was the maximum margin classifier, right? And we're going to show the same maximum margin classifier, which appears here. Okay, but if I add this blue data point here. And I gave it a strict, if I gave it the strict rule of everything has to be classified correctly, then the boundary has to, will be drawn here. Okay, if I say you must draw the line so that all the blue ends up on one side and all the purple ends up on the other side, you must do it here. Okay, you, you would have to draw the line here. Okay, but now our margin is really <coughs> tiny, right? So the Support vector classifier says, you know what, try to still keep this margin thing going, okay? Try to still keep the margin thing going. And just um, if, you, if you have the maximum margin and, you know, a certain point is giving you trouble, um, you know, that's fine. Just you, you, get, um, you get a budget for, like, kind of uh, misclassifying a point. So the mar um, support vector classifier um, would be would probably still be closer to this dashed line, maybe adjusted a tiny bit, okay? And we would just say, all right, I'm still going to try to go for this maximum margin type of thing, but um, I've, I'm going to end up misclassifying this point. And uh, um, but you've given me some kind of basically wiggle room to to do such a thing. Okay. Okay. So, um, so here is a support vector classifier um, where we can separate. The blue, okay, eight, nine, seven, eight, nine, ten are blue. Can you guys see those colors? Um, so these are, so this is, it's possible to draw a single line where uh, we get perfect separation, okay? And, um, um, and here the margins are shown, and we have some, some points that are actually within the margins, okay? And, uh, and again, we get like a small budget for letting points. Um, even if they're not misclassified, it still costs them to kind of go within the margins, okay? So, so we give, give ourselves a small budget here, okay? Um, here we cannot draw uh, a line that's perfect, that will perfectly separate the blue from the, um, the purple, okay? Um, and uh, um, here we basically they added it's the same data uh, as this but they've added this purple point 11 and this blue point 12 and and so now the resulting hyperplane uh, ends up here and the margin uh, ends up getting adjusted differently okay and so here these get are actually misclassified um, but again we have like a, a little bit of a budget to kind of 
to kind of deal with that, okay? And so, um, so the adjustment here versus the regular maximum margin classifier is that um, it has to be greater than the M, okay, the margin, but the margin is not multiplied by one, but it's multiplied by a smaller number, okay? And in fact, um, epsilon can itself be bigger than one, and M would end up being negative, okay? <laughs> um, and, um, and here we just have uh, a kind of a total, uh, the sum of all of these epsilons, okay? If, um, if the epsilons um, are all zeros, you get the maximum margin classifier. If you get something epsilons that are not zero or a little bit bigger, you get the support vector classifier. And here we kind of just want to make sure that the sum of all the epsilons are less than some um, value C, okay? Some value C. So all of the epsilons, whatever they are, they just have to be less than some value C. Now, uh, again, um, the, we are not trying to minimize. There's no minimization thing set to the, the epsilon, okay? We're still trying to maximize the margin, okay? The only thing now is that when we maximize the margin, we say, oh, we used to define the margin as the going from the boundary to the nearest points, okay? Now we're going to say, uh, and, and we still kind of define it that way, except um, if we can allow things to enter the margin or uh, end up on the wrong side of the margin, and we just say, all right, if you want to do something like that and count this guy as the points where you're going to draw the margin and this is where you're going to draw the margin, these ones just cost a small penalty. All right. I don't, I don't know if this, if it's kind of making sense. So we're basically saying, um, so the margin is the boundary to the nearest point, and maybe there's just someone inconvenient, and you're going to say, you know what, I don't want to say my margin goes from the boundary to the nearest point. The nearest point is really an inconvenient observation. So the, the next nearest is much better. So we're going to go from the boundary to kind of the next nearest point. And I'm willing to pay the penalty for ignoring this point as my nearest point, is, is basically what we're saying. Okay. Um, and, and similarly, you also have to pay a penalty for having um, the point on the wrong side, okay? Um, and so that's what the support vector classifier does, is we're still trying to maximize our margin, okay? Except we, where we used to say, um, the margin goes from the boundary to the nearest point, we're going to say um, you kind of get to choose which points are counted as the nearest points. Um, and if you're going to ignore the nearest point, or if you're going to have something on the wrong side of the boundary, you just kind of have to pay a penalty. All right? and, uh, and, that, and those penalties are these epsilon values. Okay. And, and it's just that the sum of all the penalties you pay have to be less than some, some value C. Okay. So. Okay. We still try to maximize the margin, okay? All right, the margin is still, okay, distance. From the boundary to kind of nearest point, okay? Okay, but you, you now have the option. <laughs> To quote, and I don't know if ignore is the right word, okay? 
ignore the the point that is actually the nearest point. <laughs> um, the actual. Okay, you now have the option to quote ignore the actual nearest point. Um, okay, uh, but ignoring a point, you know, costs uh, penalty, which is kind of our epsilon. All right, and it's just kind of the the sum of these epsilons have to be less than C. Okay, and then there's a, a greater penalty for misclassifications. So loosely, that's kind of what a support vector classifier is doing. Okay, and so when you do that, you end up getting um, different um, different. Uh, boundary things here, okay? So here we have um, the support vector classifier using four different values of the tuning parameter, okay? The largest value of C was used in the top panel and the smallest values and smaller values were used in the top right, bottom left, and bottom right panels. When C is large, there's a high tolerance for observations being on the wrong side, and so the margin will be large. As C decreases, the tolerance for observations being on the wrong side of the margin decreases and the margin narrows, okay? So, so here we have a large margin, okay? Because we're kind of ignoring uh, a lot of the nearest points and we're gonna say this is my quote nearest point, right? I've got, I've got like a, a large budget to ignore all of the nearest points, right? And so here uh, as my budget for ignoring points shrinks, I gotta say, okay, well I can't um, ignore all of these points, okay? And uh, and so now I can only ignore a few, right? And so, um, um, and basically it costs, uh, and the cost for ignoring the points is, um, uh, is not, uh, the same for all points, right? So the points that are closer to the um, margin uh, cost less, but then the um, as you get closer in here, these these ones cost more and more to ignore, right? So the nearest ones cost the most to ignore, and as as you uh, you spend less and less as, as the cost goes down. So um, so anyway, and then yeah, misclassifications cost the most. Okay, so anyway, these. Um, as we decrease our um, kind of our cost, then the boundaries shrink. Okay, I mean the margins shrink because we're only, we're allowed to ignore kind of fewer points um, with each point um, kind of uh, going like that, right? And so um, so here with kind of a low C, we can kind of ignore a few of these things and we can misclassify a couple of these points and my margin still gets to kind of be here and here. Uh, that's what we have. Uh, again, trying to draw a support vector boundary yourself manually is like uh, very, very, very difficult to do, okay? It's, um, you can kind of do it for the maximal margin classifier, okay, where you can definitely get everything on one side and the other side correctly. But once you start saying like, okay, now we have to factor in the cost to ignore a point and stuff like that, then it becomes um, it, almost impossible to do without a computer, okay? So support vector machines or support vector classifiers really, really depend on the computer to draw these boundaries for us because it's, it's just not something that we can really do um, in our head, okay?
Okay. Um, and then so, and here's a situation where it's just a total disaster, okay? Um, we've got blue down here and purple in the middle and blue up here, okay? And if we were to try to use a straight line classifier, we would, this, this is the results that we get, okay? There just happens to be a few more purple kind of over here and a few more blue, and so we're drawing the straight line. But this is, this is obviously really, really not a good um, classifier, okay? I'm just going to keep going. I think we're going to end it early today. All right. Um, and so when if this were the data here, a straight line classifier is not going to work. Okay, a straight line classifier is not going to work. And so um, the support vector machine allows us to draw nonlinear boundaries. Okay, it says you know what. Uh, here we were talking about hyperplanes, and hyperplanes all have this nice beta, beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 plus beta 2 x2 um, thing, okay? And, um, and, and now we can talk about, you know what, what if we drew something like a, uh, so here they do um, a quadratic type of thing using x1 and x1 squared and x2 and x2 squared. And you can kind of generalize the same formulas and all of that. Um, but really, um, probably, I'm going to just jump straight to what we call kernel functions. Okay. And so a kernel function is um, is based on an inner product. Okay. And so an inner product is basically just um, uh, you know you take two vectors and you multiply each each of the elements element wise. So you do the first element of x i times the first element of the other um, of the other vector, and then you you do those things and you um, you add them up. Okay, so that's the uh, the inner product of two um, two vectors. Okay. And um, and so the um, support vector classifier can be defined using inner products, and it's just we we just kind of take the inner products and um, and add them up. Okay. With a sub, uh, kernel function, we apply some kind of transformation to the inner product and. I don't know how far I want to get into this, okay? But um, you can do a polynomial um, kernel, okay, which does something like this, and it just takes the inner product and it transforms it by raising it to the d power. And then the other big thing is the um, Gaussian, or what we call the radial kernel, which takes the inner product and it exponentiates it, okay? Now, what happens when we do take a, a kernel function? Okay, it's quite a it's difficult to explain, um, but it's basically taking the data and it's projecting it into a higher dimensionality. Okay, it takes your data, which might you know in these pictures our data exists in two dimensions, okay? In these pictures, our data exists in two dimensions, and what the kernel does is it takes the data and it projects it to a higher, um, higher dimensionality, okay? And so there's a little YouTube video that I like to show. Here it is, okay? So this, uh, okay, we gotta watch a LinkedIn commercial. Um, skip that, okay. Um, and so here, what it's gonna do is it's going to use uh, a quadratic polynomial kernel, okay? So it's, I don't know if you can see. So here is our, the data is, uh, there's blue and there's red points, okay? 
And currently, if we asked you to draw a straight line to separate the blue and the red, it's not possible, okay? Um, but what using a kernel function does, and in this case, we're using a quadratic polynomial kernel, is we are going to project this two-dimensional data into three dimensions, okay? And so it gets projected into three dimensions like this, okay? So kind of points close to here end up at the bottom, and points farther away end up higher up, okay? And then, now that we've projected it into a higher dimensionality, we can draw a flat plane, okay? We can draw a, a flat hyperplane that separates the blue from the red classes, okay? Which then gets projected back down into a, uh, a circle or uh, an ellipse on in our uh, two-dimensional space, okay? I'll, uh, I'll just kind of draw it again, or play it again. So uh, we have two-dimensional data. It gets projected into a higher dimensional space. And then in the higher dimensional space, it is possible to draw a, a plane, a flat surface that separates it, okay? Um, the, maybe the hardest thing to deal when we're uh, um, thinking about kind of the these kernel functions is that not all of them have such a nice visual interpretation, okay? So if you do the um, polynomial kernel and you just raise it to the second power, it's, it's basically doing something like that, okay? It's doing a, uh, a nice thing, okay? But then if you raise it to like the third power, okay, it, um, it doesn't, it's no longer in three-dimensional space. It gets it, it, go, it goes, it jumps up into, um, I don't know, like n-dimensional space, okay? And technically, if you use the radial kernel with the exponent, it technically projects it into infinite dimensional space, which I cannot even comprehend, okay? And the, the reason for it being infinite dimensional space is because um, it, the radial kernel is actually um, an inner product of the Taylor expansion of the um, exponent function, right? So you can do a Taylor expansion of um, e to the x and, uh, and get this infinite series, and, and you can rewrite it as an inner product, okay? So, so that's a nice visualization that I just showed you. But it only works for like certain kernels. Most of the kernels don't have a nice visual thing, okay? But you have to just conceptually imagine the data being projected in some higher dimensional space that we that we are unable to visualize, okay? That we are not able to visualize. And in that higher dimensional space, you can draw a straight line that will separate the, the two classes. Okay, and that's and that's what we do. Okay, and so somehow when we project the data, this data into a higher dimensional space using some polynomial kernel of degree three, which again we, we can't we can't pr visualize anymore. You, you you think like you can just do something? You can't. Okay, it, it's it, uh, I think the th th third degree polynomial kernel ends up in like five or seven dimensional space, which I don't know how to visualize either. Okay, but again. There exists some hyper flat hyperplane that will separate kind of the, the purple from the blue, and this is what it looks like. This is what the boundary looks like once we project it back down. Okay, this is uh, the result of the radial basis kernel. Okay, if we project the, the data into um, infinite dimensional space <laughs> with the radial kernel, um, there exists some straight hyperplane, and this is the, the boundary that it draws there, okay? Um, uh, yeah, I don't know <laughs> um, if, you're, if you're okay with me just saying that it, it projects it to a higher dimensional space that we cannot visualize, then, then that explains the support vector machine. 
um, if you're not okay with that, and it and it took me a long time myself to get okay with not being able to visualize this thing. I, I wanted my brain wanted to say, well, what does this look like? And and it's 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 just not it's not possible to draw. Okay, um, and so this. This little animation is like the simple version where we're going from two dimensions to three dimensions. Okay. These things, these things don't work. Okay, um, work that way. But anyway, um, so you get the support vector machine and it draws some kind of boundary. And uh, you know, at a, at a practical level, these these things work quite well, especially if you have um, just kind of two. Um, Two classes and stuff, okay, and um, and so if we, uh, I guess you guys will see the um, the lab. Okay, but you can just um, you can use the e ten seventy one and SVM functions here to do it and. Um, I'm going to do library E1071 and then and when you fit the um, support vector uh, machine okay you have uh, there's a few um, um, there's a few um, parameters here okay and the the ones that you can mess with will be um, gamma and cost, okay? And so this cost is a little bit different, okay, than, than what we have. Um, so here we were talking about C being kind of like the budget. Here it's um, actually kind of the, um, the, the opposite. And, um, and if you increase the cost, it's kind of the, uh, the cost of the violations. Um, so each, each point that gets misclassified um, it basically costs more. It, it has a higher um, higher cost to kind of violating your budget and so you don't um, so the support vector classifier will really try to um, avoid um, th those types of um, uh, types of mistakes here, okay? Um, Let's see. Let me see. I, I'm going to go back to my 102B notes on support vector machines to get the uh, the pictures. Right, hang on. Let me. Uh... Okay. So. Um, let me just kind of plot um, all right, okay uh, yeah maybe maybe this looks better all right so these are our um, so this is just some uh, some data that I'm drawing here okay and um, and so we want to be able to draw a boundary between basically the blue and the red, okay? I've got these blue pluses and red minuses here, okay? And so here I'm going to just kind of show um, what, um, what we can have for the um, different kind of support vector machines, okay? So a linear kernel, a linear kernel will draw a straight line, okay? And so if I draw a straight line, okay? And and if I say you cannot make any kind of mistakes, this is going to be the 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 plot that we end up getting. Okay? Let me um Let me change this.
sorry, let me uh, just do this and color equals width. Oh shoot, something broke. x equals 2, color equals That's better. So if we uh, if we do that and we say you can't make any mistakes, this is kind of what the uh, the boundary is going to be. Okay. As I uh, decrease the cost of making a mistake, okay, then um, we can this this red guy ends up on the on the wrong side of the boundary. Okay, and uh, and we get kind of a a, a different for boundary here, okay? And so here, uh, I further reduce the cost of each mistake, and we can end up, we'll end up getting a boundary that looks kind of like this, okay? So this is using the, the linear kernel, okay? Um, the radial kernel allows us to fit kind of odd shapes, all right? And so the uh, by default the radial kernel will try to um, fit kind of a, a a boundary here. Okay, so this darker black line will be our boundary, and these are kind of contour plots, and, and we end up getting kind of a uh, you know one one thing that gets classified wrong. Okay, if I increase the cost of kind of um, making a mistake, it's going to try to avoid misclassifying this red red point here. So this, I, I'm changing um, my call to say cost is 5 here, okay, and there it, it's avoided making the, uh, the, wrong, uh, the wrong thing, okay, and you can kind of see this is technically not our margin, but it's, it's pretty close to the idea there, okay. And if I increase the cost even further to like say 500, it does the same thing, and it's it's just kind of uh, made our margins even skinnier. Um, let me uh, if I reduce the cost to say 0.01, okay, then uh, it doesn't mind that uh, that we end up that the red line ends up on the wrong side. Okay. Um, the other option that you can kind of mess around with in um, with a radial thing is gamma. Okay, and gamma is basically how wiggly you can have the um, the boundary. Okay, so as you increase the gamma, you're going to get something um, more and more. So this is that was this is gamma equal to one. And here I'll try gamma equals two. Okay. And you can see um, the boundaries get more and more, I don't know, wiggly-ish. Okay. And as I increase the gamma even more, um, you, we start seeing these, um, like the boundaries almost ap appear directly around the data points themselves, okay? And at, at a very high gamma, they, um, they're they like the boundaries directly around each data point, okay? Um, and on the other hand, we can reduce the gamma, 
So I'm going to go in the opposite direction, and it's going to kind of get more and more smoother um, uh, like less wiggles in our boundary, okay? So here's uh, 0.7, here's gamma 0.5. As I reduce this, here's gamma 0.3. It gets more and more um, like smoothed out, okay? So this is gamma point, this one's gamma 0.1, and if I take gamma down to point to zero, it ends up being linear. Whoops, it doesn't like it, okay. Okay, well at 0.001, we get something that's that's pretty much linear. Okay, um, it won't it won't let me do um, do that. Okay, um, and then and so now so here's gamma one, and now I can try to messing around. So with gamma one, and if I increase the cost, then using kind of this the the kind of the permissible wiggliness that gamma 1 allows it's really trying to avoid misclassifying this point here okay but if i decrease the cost then we'll get a smoother function that misclassifies um, if i use something like gamma point 1 gamma point 1 says the curve has to be smooth okay so so we end up getting point 1 and watch what happens as I increase the cost of a misclassification. So gamma point 0.1 has this kind of boundary. As I increase it from 0.05 to say 0.15, okay, um, to 0.5, okay, I, we can see that this line will try to um, try to conform to kind of avoid misclassifying this. Okay, so right now the cost is still pretty low, so it doesn't mind misclassifying. Okay, as, uh, as the cost goes up of a misclassification, so now the cost is 0.4, gamma is still 0.1, it's, you're gonna see it start to try to adjust to kind of avoid misclassifying it, okay? So here's, the gamma is still 0.1, so it's, it wants really smooth curves. Um, and I'm gonna put I'm gonna push the cost all the way up to 140 to say really really do not misclassify the point okay and so um, so there it it squeezes through and it gets there okay um, so you can kind of adjust the cost in the gamma on the SVM um, and again don't try to figure out how these boundaries are drawn by yourself okay it's just not something that we should uh, I think waste our brain power on the the computer does a good job of it kind of just following these um, rules regarding uh, uh, where, where it wants to draw okay um, yes yeah so when we adjust and determine the parameter values of the things you just used by like cross validation or how would we choose which ones to yeah, I mean, so yeah, cross validation is often the the thing that we say. Um, so that was, you know, that's kind of like your training data, right? And and then you'd hopefully have some test data against which you can get some kind of test data error rate, right? And so you'd probably have to try different values of the cost and different values of the gamma to decide, um, you know, which is your best set of values to use to minimize the, um, the error rate in your test data or in your um, via cross-validation. Um, the kind of the rule of thumb is that increasing gamma will increase variance and reduce bias, okay? Um, and uh, increasing cost will also have the same effect of increasing variance and reducing bias. Um, but you could see kind of the subtle differences between um, increasing the cost and increasing the gamma. So gamma allows for more wiggly boundaries and cost um, depends more on the um, individual data points that are kind of in the wrong zones. Okay. Uh,
uh, I think that's all we need to say. I don't think there's a section on re relationship to logistic regression, but um, I think it's okay if we skip it. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, I'll, I'll ask a few questions on support vector machines. It's um, the support vector machines, it's more of a, we don't really get into the nitty gritty of the math because it, it, it gets messy, okay? So um, so we'll, we'll leave it at that and, uh, and we'll just say, you know, um, probably for chapter nine, I'll do a little bit more of the applied questions where you can kind of um, use the, the computer to help uh, answer, answer these things. Okay, um, and then next week is chap uh, week five, and we'll cover chapter 10, and we would have achieved my goal of covering the, um, the textbook uh, in the quarter. Um, and, uh, and then with the time left over, um, uh, I was thinking of looking at uh, text data uh, and maybe XGBoost or something. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Something that you guys would find interesting. Yeah. Uh, we can do exam review on, um, I guess, week six on uh, on Monday or something. Um, but really, I mean, if you want to prepare, start studying for the exam. I would say just go through the um, conceptual questions at e at the end of each chapter. Even the ones I haven't assigned for homework. Start kind of reviewing those and just just making sure. I feel like if you are able to answer all the conceptual questions in this textbook, like you've got a good a good handle on the on the subject matter, okay? And then every, as far as like doing the practical stuff and the applied stuff, um, you can always use the book as a reference. Or really, um, what you should be using is Google and just looking for the the latest versions, right? This textbook is is great, but uh, a lot of the applied stuff always changes a little bit from year to year as, uh, as the software and stuff improve. So, um, so that's good. But if you're able to answer all the conceptual questions from this textbook, I feel like you've gotten uh, a good handle on, on this subject of statistical learning. And, uh, and yeah. What's the format of the final? The format of the final, I haven't decided if it's going to be uh, uh, open. So. Um, Short answer, open-ended, is much easier to write, much harder to grade, OK? Um, multiple choice questions, much harder to write, much easier to grade. So I have to decide which, which one I want to do, OK? Um, so uh, but yeah, it, it'll be, I, I haven't decided what the format of the final is. But it'll just be um, conceptual questions, yeah. True, true, false questions will be hard, right? So yeah, okay. Yeah, final will be on week six Wednesday, and um, okay. I don't know. I haven't decided. I haven't written the final yet, so so I can't answer any questions about what the final exam will be. But I'm telling you, a good study will be the conceptual questions at the end of each chapter. Okay. Okay, we'll uh, we'll end here, and uh, we'll see you guys uh, next week. And good luck as you uh, work on um, uh, the competition stuff.